Hey everybody, uh, Bright coming to you from behind my favourite contact area in the mountains, southern Australia. It's uh, 6.57pm on Sunday the 21st of December 2014, I think. I'm uh, about three quarters of the way through of a severe flu, so I got out of bed today and I've been trying to be active, but I'm starting to feel it now. So this is my first walk in four days. Oh, there's a nice wallaby. Very dark looking little fellow with an orange tail, orange at the end. He's looking at me. I thought today, I'm conscious as well, but oh, if I tell you what I thought today, sorry. That because I had the problem with software transferring these recordings that I have a whole bunch to catch up on so uh, they're going to seem way out of date but once I've caught up on them hopefully by the end of the year I can start by just uploading fresh recordings anyway hopefully the content will uh, be independent of the date to forgive me for snuffling continuously. I kind of feel like I've been drowned in maple syrup. <sighs> it's a warm day today. Well, not really warm, but 32, 33 degrees Celsius. And uh, for me, it felt really hot. There goes that wallaby. Beautiful silver body underneath and Brownie orange on top with a dark tail and orange at the end. So yeah, it's felt really hot to me. It's been a real struggle. And you know, in between feeling like I'm freezing, I felt like I'm boiling. So this walk is actually really difficult and I'm not sure how far I'll be able to go. Today I wanted to talk about an idea that is perhaps at the crux of the ET contact phenomenon and some of you will know from my blog that I've been uh, rereading some John Mack material and earlier in the 90s read some of his books some of the ideas didn't really not that they didn't gel with me I didn't fully comprehend them I was still trying to work through my own experiences and still very confusing and I'm pretty sure I came across Passport to the Cosmos in the library and spent some time with it, but I actually thought I owned it, I couldn't find it. So I probably didn't own it. A lot of books have come my way and gone. I thought I would have kept that one though. So anyway, I got the updated Kindle version. I think it was updated uh, a few years before John died. And um, I found it very interesting. I think it's the best book on the contact phenomenon that I've read anyway. I will admit I haven't read a lot of books, but I can't imagine anybody would explore it as well as John's explored it. But uh, that may be true, may not be true. What I like about John was his willingness to meet experiences exactly where they're at, hold the energy of the fear and confusion and excitement, joy and nurture them. Sort of, it sounds like out of a place of feeling like victims to feeling empowered. Some of you will be aware I've talked about a developmental continuum for ET experiences on my blog. Sorry, going uphill here, it's hard work. I'm gonna wait till I stop. So I've been thinking about this idea for more than a decade now. And I'm reading John's book. 
help me to sort of generate some new insights. I sort of found myself reading it late at night and then thinking about my own experiences late into the night. Not good when you're recovering from flu and maybe a side effect of kind of delirium if you like. So I've been revisiting these kind of models of um, development and, and how we respond. And so I presented a general form of one of those models, a developmental continuum on my blog, where on one end you have people who see separateness and experience fear and perceive hostility on the part of the aliens who are abducting them. And on the other you have people who see wholeness, oneness, connectedness and perceive love from the aliens and a sense of being nurtured and cared for and uh, feel empowered aren't victims of the experience and what I tried to explain in my blog with the continuum is that some people seem to follow a very clear trajectory of development along that continuum moving from one portion in the direction of fear and separation towards wholeness and love and acceptance and other people remain relatively stagnant and it seems to only reinforce their their original um, beliefs and perceptions so I wanted to explore something um, from one end of that continuum and that is from the the end of the continuum, it doesn't see it as alien abduction, but ET contact and sees it as contact with a benevolent force. So I wanted to talk about the idea of ETs as the divine, as source, as God, and I wanted to present a couple of ideas there. I'm really struggling to uh, function at the moment, so I'm just going to go out of here and access the notes I made a few minutes ago. I hope it won't, uh, won't turn off, so bear with me if it does. So far so good. Yes, we're still there. So I, I guess I had always whenever I was really conscious of this I had always some deep level been aware that the ETs were more than just beings on another planet from another planet and I don't like the term extraterrestrial or alien but unfortunately they're tools for communication and they each carry their own baggage I, I think aliens carries more baggage than extraterrestrial but for now I don't know of a better word So, um, one thing I've become aware of is by asking people if they wanted to ask the ETs on new questions, that the question of God comes up a lot, you know, what is God and how are we connected to God and how are you connected to God and all this kind of thing. So people have this deep yearning to know God and that's reflected in their questions. And when I asked Satelia, some of you might recall, in on January 19th, 2011, who are you? They responded with, we are God incarnate. And they went on to explain that and demonstrate that over subsequent visits. And in the work that I've been doing, um, also with a collective of eight ETs, they've been teaching me about what this means and about what the, the uh, small self and the greater self are as aspects of uh, an individual and how each of us carries uh, an aspect that is within the whole, that is the whole, that is God. So I guess probably more in the last five years this has really come to the fore of my consciousness, this question of understanding, but it's, it's been there for a long time, probably since 1991 I'd say, when I first had conscious awareness of uh, an encounter, uh, one that I could readily uh, remember at least part of it. I've never gone back and explored more of that particular encounter, but I have subsequent encounters with those beings. So 
So I wanted to present some possibilities and forgive me if my voice is squeaking everywhere. I'm really struggling to talk. Many people uh, think that um, ETs have come here to save us and there's an embargo on our planet, blah blah blah. So I just want to quickly address that first. One, the creator races don't let any race leave planet until it grows up and, and becomes spacefaring only when it's mature enough not to be destructive um, when we're not a threat to others so in that sense yeah there's an embargo but it's for all races that are like that um, is there an embargo per se where there's no contact allowed no of course not that's ridiculous there's no such ideas there and the ETs aren't here to save us, if anything, they're here to nurture us and empower us and to embrace us as part of the cosmic family. But that can't happen in an open way until we grow up. Because we're a threat to ourselves and we're a threat to everything else and we'll be a threat to them if they declare themselves openly. So I want to present some possibilities for which I don't have an answer. Um, and let me underscore this by saying that the ETs, and certainly the ETs I've had contact with, they don't engage in um, deception. They don't say one thing, but actually they mean something else. They're not covertly masking any agendas or anything like that. Um, if you ask a question, they will tell you honestly. Your understanding of it might not be up to par, and so you will interpret it maybe differently to how they intended it. That happens from time to time. But they don't actively um, deceive us, and their understanding of things is obviously different to our own. So we may not fully comprehend what they're trying to tell us. So let me use the Tilly as an example. They said we are God incarnate. And as I understood it, they had developed over long periods of time, we're talking about uh, a history that goes back billions of years, and you know, I use that in a relative context, I mean time is not measured that way by them. They became aware that they are what we would call God, the essence of all things. They became aware that they are God experiencing that particular form and so they lost all attachment to singular identity separate self but they still experience and enjoy those identities they just don't have the attachment to them so um, because of that they have a universal compassion for all all of existence um, no preferences at all. That is why they walk uh, a field of energy on, on their every planet's surface so they don't walk on anything and cause needless um, destruction to anything. It's happened from time to time but it's not something that they uh, like to do because they feel the suffering of all things and they know that they exist in all things. So that's how I understand their conception of it. And I'm just talking about one race now. There's maybe seven or eight others that I could talk about who have expressed similar things. But we'll just talk about the Telia. So they kind of embody this idea that um, the self becomes realized. What does that mean? Uh, the self becomes aware of its true nature. And... Uh, its true nature is that it is essentially God. So they don't see the self as bounded by any limitation. They see the self as boundless. It just happens to be manifesting in this particular form. So the other possibilities for what this means are also worth exploring. And I'm not going to give an opinion, just present the possibilities. And I don't ultimately know the answer, although I have some feelings about this. I'd leave it to you to explore this and, and to remain open to the possibility of other ways of understanding it. 
So, it's also possible that um, God, in general, chooses an intermediary form, and that form may uh, be a long-term expression, such as Delia, who've lived for a millennia and millennia, uh, a long, long time. So God chooses to take that form, to express itself and become aware of itself. Well, God chooses to manifest in a temporary form. So you have a contact experience, you meet a being, but actually what you're doing is meeting God who was chosen uh, to take that form just for a short while. It might be a day, it might be two days, it might be a week, it might be an hour, just to make contact with you. So in that sense, the beings that we're meeting are God itself just in a temporary form. So it can connect with us in a way that's somewhat familiar. Maybe not very familiar, but somewhat familiar. <coughs> so in a sense, if you think about that, really both of those possibilities um, realizing that you are God and God taking an intermediary form are really God sees itself uh, me for example or you and reaches out through another expression of the self which is the ETs uh, back to itself again so imagine a, a loop if you like or, or a spiral God is perpetually uh, reaching back into itself and I guess one thing to consider is what I've said before is that all of these individual forms that we know as life are really just um, I think John Mack used the term multitudinous uh, expressions so, and I've used the term myself infinite expressions of God so these are all forms in which God has embodied itself, fragmented itself, if you like, out of the whole. And they still exist within the whole. So God sees itself through another form. One form sees itself through another form. So that's uh, what I think is happening in those two possibilities. There is another possibility that there is yet another group of beings above ETs and some of you will be aware that my friend who I call Dude has expressed that his race are aware of um, other beings who are formless and they have relationships with them and he doesn't fully understand them but when I say this you need to be careful not to impose something that's your own projection onto it so I want to explain something to you Dude can take any form that he wants and he can move through what we call time and he calls space and what we consider to be space. He says everything is just space. He can access that and move in and out as readily as you breathe and that's one of the experiences I talked about about him taking me into the future um, as far as 20 odd years I think. And when I was in the in-between state of that, everything disappeared. There was nothing but he and I. Everything turned white. So, in a sense, he is able to access these formless states. But the way he explains it to me is that there are these truly formless beings. And other ATs as well, including he can transform, I'll talk about this another time, can transform themselves into uh, light and then into other forms. So he's talking about something beyond that. I don't really fully comprehend that. So let's assume that there are these beings that are, are truly formless. I think even light is a form. Um, 
So let's assume there are these formless beings beyond any form that we know. They may well be reaching out to uh, what we consider to be ETs as intermediary forms. Um, they may be uh, beings that know that they are God and they are reaching out through these intermediary forms and they may either have relationships with the ETs or they may become the ETs once again in the short term or the long term and then establish relationships with us. So the possibility is that there are many different levels between the ultimate perspective of God and the perspective of a limited separate self. There could be many different um, layers, some of which have form and some of which are truly formless. And they reach down into, uh, I don't like using this word, but we'll use it for now. They reach down into these lower realms and connect with them and in so doing connect uh, those beings with the perception of God and connectedness, oneness. So that's just um, one set of possibilities for you to consider. Just heard a kangaroo moving through the bracken behind me. Thought he was hopping this way. No, he's um, not aware of me and he's happily doing this thing slowly hopping up the hill. It's like hard work, it's about a 45 degree angle with thick bush. So when we talk about meeting, uh, making contact with ETs, it's possible that we're meeting um, beings from other planets who, uh, who recognize intellectually that everything is an expression of God, who know from a felt experience that they are expressions of God and so is everything else, or who may be uh, formless beings who are taking that form, or we might literally be meeting the Creator itself taking those forms. One thing I guess I have to say to all of that is, in our perception there are um, likely to be trillions of uh, planets, many of which sustain life. And so the likelihood that these planets have life forms that are visiting other planets is very high to me, and my experience tells me that that's true. So to me it's likely there are these highly evolved beings, and one of them the creator races, who have realized their innate nature, that, that they are God incarnate. So, I, in a sense, I see no reason for any intermediary forms. I see that these beings simply develop such awareness that they become truly, um, in a feeling sense, aware that they are God experiencing separateness or the perceived separateness and no attachment to identity. But I can't rule out for sure that there isn't intermediary forms at, at play here. And maybe another way of looking at it is if everything is God, if everything in existence and non-existence is God, and if, if everything in form and formlessness is God, then all of this is exactly as it is meant to be and uh, all forms actually and all uh, formless things reflect what God really is and are what God really is. So, you know, we could say they're both intermediaries and not intermediaries. Maybe it gets down to semantics, uh, how we look at that. I wish I could come up with a metaphor to um, to explain it to you. I, I suppose maybe 
um, you know, really bad one might be to say a person that controls puppets, you know, the puppet master. And I'm hesitant to use that because people in um, people in the conspiracy field. Sorry, I thought that kangaroo was coming down. People in the conspiracy fields often sort of talk in those kind of metaphors. So I'm conscious that um, maybe we could use that metaphor, but it's tainted. So let's say a person controls puppets. So the puppet is seen as the intermediary, but the puppet has a character and a voice all of its own. And we connect with the puppet and the narrative that goes with the, the puppet and the reality of the puppet story. When in actual fact we are connecting with the puppet master, but we are not aware of its presence. So I guess in the same way we could say that um, we're connecting with God in everything, but we're not directly willing to recognize um, God's presence. And God is working through all things. Just take out the word control, I think. You know, it's a bit damaging and tainting to use that word. So in a sense, ET contact is really uh, contact with God. But let's play the devil's advocate and say, well, okay, if I have contact with a serial killer, I'm also in contact with God. And that's true. There's nothing I can say to argue against that. The difference being is that the entity that comes halfway across the universe and attempts to bring some nurturing and well-being to my life, who knows that it is an expression of God, is different to the entity on my planet who doesn't recognize that it's connected to everything and attempts to take the lives of the things that it wants to control. All are expressions of God. One is aware that it is an expression of God and the other is not. One might try to act like an expression of God, controlling everything, doing whatever it feels like, being omnipotent, but it's not really. It's a limited perception of God. So that perception of God that comes about in contact is really, to me, about the self becoming aware of the self. And so here I'm talking about that greater self, or that other aspect of self that is the whole. It's really about God becoming aware of God through each of the myriad forms that, that all the different beings in the universe inhabit. So for me, the contact experience is really a transformative experience um, which begins with great trauma and relinquishing control. But if we allow that to happen and, and we relinquish any real attachment to control in the body and we trust in what's happening, then we open ourselves up to meeting, if you like, the face of God. Um, seeing God manifest in the purest forms, the most awake forms, the most aware forms, which for me has been the experience of, of the ETs. And those that aren't willing to do that, who see abduction and hostility and control, more often not, rather than meeting uh, face of God, they will meet the projections from within, the darkness that's disowned, and those projections, of course, end up um, assimilating, uh, sticking to the face of those entities, and so what is within and is disowned is pushed away and finds itself stuck to what seems like a, a separate thing, what seems like a threat. So the small self perceives the small self as a threat. And there is no movement towards perception of the greater self. Anyway, I'll have a lot more to say about that, but for now I just wanted to whet your appetite with other ways to see uh, the ETs and, and seeing the ETs as the divine itself. Ultimately, what they're trying to do is to nurture us and empower us 
through their love and guidance and care to the point where we can also see that we are God incarnate, that we are God experiencing one of an infinite number of forms, and that as God incarnate we are the whole and we're connected to everything within the whole, all the parts of the whole. And because of that, uh, we can feel, we can uh, be moved by great empathy, feeling for the suffering of the whole. So I think what the ETs are trying to do is to help God know itself through the myriad forms, and for the myriad forms to become aware that they are actually not just myriad forms, but they are the whole. Anyway, I kind of feel like I'm waffling on a bit here. My my influenza has uh, hijacked my brain and is not letting me think terribly clearly. So I'm going to go home. I'm pretty exhausted. And I've hardly walked anywhere. Until next time, take care.